Well, it's officially fall. Crisp mornings and warm afternoons greet the changes of the seasons, both with the weather and for outdoors and sports. Now, in Pennsylvania, we're into the extended trout season. They check the rule book for updates. And of course, for the hunters, it's time for final preparation as the seasons are rolling in fast. Now, if you're looking for a rewarding outdoors type hobby, you're in for a special treat when we introduce you to the intricate art of bow making, as you'll see right now when we go out in the open. Out in the Open is brought to you by Buck Hill Firearms in Mountain Home, Pennsylvania, the Northeast number one online retailer of firearms. The Pennsylvania Outdoor Writers Association, an organization of professional communicators promoting Pennsylvania's natural resources, conservation, and our hunting and fishing heritage. And by the Car Firearms Group, the number one choice for personal carry. And by the Tommy Gun Warehouse in Greeley, where you'll find the largest retail showroom in Northeast for all kinds of new and used firearms. Hey folks, welcome to this edition <laughs> of Out in the Open. I'm Alex Zedock. And I'm Joanne Zedock. How do you like this location, huh? Isn't this great? We're, oh. we're really out in the open. Oh my gosh, I love it. We've got a great outdoor show for you, too. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk to uh, Ed Burkholzer, and we're going to be talking about traditional bow making. I mean... Mm -hmm. Uh, this guy starts from scratch and ends up with some fantastic he, bows, he as you can tree. see. <laughs> yeah, you know, and uh, we're going to do that. Uh, but, you know, uh, John, um, just like you can smell the honeysuckle in the spring, <laughs> I can smell fall. Beginning September, that's right. Uh, we're here taping the show, and it's a nearly fall day. It feels Beautiful. great. The hunting seasons are on the horizon. If you haven't gotten your... Antlerless permit, now's the time to do it. I got mine. You got yours. We're going to put some meat in the freezer and do yep. things like that. But, uh, uh, you know, there's so many other things happening. I mean, it's really great fishing right now, no matter yes. where you go uh, well, can in we our go fishing area. This afternoon? Uh, yeah, well, we oh. can. And the thing is, you know, <laughs> you can do all these things and still stay, you know, away from other people. You don't have to be right. on top of people. They say if you're going to be out fishing someplace, uh, they want you to keep six feet away from everybody. So, that's about the length of your fishing rod. So that's all you got to do is make sure that, you know, they're over there, you know, oh and, you can, and you can stay six feet away, right? And you don't have to wear a mask. Uh, that's right. If you I'm should just wear a mask, them. though, when you get close to people. So right. we don't want to say you don't have to wear a mask. The thing is, wear a mask when you need right. to and right. take all the precautions like we do, right? That's absolutely. Uh, you know, it's not so bad, is it? No, we still get a chance to be yeah. out in the open. And, you know, you get used to things because... You know, because it's going to be around for a while and you've got to be able to handle it and take care of yourself and your family and still get out and enjoy the great outdoors. And this is the safest place to be. So I we're going to get, uh, yeah, go ahead. I think that one of the things that keeps us happy during all of this time is look. <laughs> we, we get don't a chance need to be out here. Us. That's we're right. Out. We get a chance it's to be so out here. So, nice. so what we're going to do is we're going to introduce our friend Ed Burkholzer, who is going to take us through the steps, the things that he's been doing for I don't know, 30 years, maybe longer, and learn some things that, uh, <laughs> that he's learned about traditional bow making and shooting traditional bows and, and doing these things and why he does it. So don't go away, we'll be right back. Buck Hill Firearms, home of the $10 transfer, located at 916 Route 390 in Mountain Home, Pennsylvania. You never have to make an appointment. We're open 10 a.m. till 6 p.m. Tuesday through Saturday. Buck Hill Firearms is a full-service gun shop with on-site gunsmithing. Buck Hill Firearms NRA certified instructors are here to help you choose a gun that's right for you. Buck Hill Firearms, 916 Route 390 in Mountain Home, Pennsylvania, right next to the Mountain Home Diner. Check out the website at buckhillfirearms.com. 
Are you interested in becoming an outdoor communicator, writer, photographer, podcaster, or even YouTuber? Here's some advice from some of Pennsylvania's top communicators. Or deer hunting or birding or whatever. I think if, if you're passionate about it, it'll show in your writing. So that would be my number one point. Good advice. Similarly, be sincere and uh, write to a variety of audience. Um, it's great to have your passions, and that definitely comes through in your writing every time. Readers who know the sport and know you're faking it will see through it. Um, defer to the expert when you don't know, when you aren't the expert in it. Always pull in those great contacts, make relationships, always be handing out business cards because the connection and the networking that you have, those opportunities here at conference and out in the real world um, are going to pay off because you never know when you need to make a phone call to get some insight to work into an article. What, what they've said are the first things that I thought of, but I'll, I'll add to this. Um, uh, I've got a shelf of books at home just on writing, period. William Zinzer has written a classic called On Writing Well. He's written another one that fewer people know of called Writing to Learn. It's amazing how much you learn when you've got to investigate a subject. Um, people say write what you know. Maybe that's a good starting place, but you can always learn something more when you're writing. I, I often learn more. I come away after writing something, knowing more about it than I did starting out. So write, write what you're passionate about, but also write to learn. The fact that all four of us were going to mention the passion thing, that, that, must, that must really resonate. But in addition to that, I would say it's nice to be the smartest in the room. But you want to be the hardest worker. I think that's far more important. Be the hardest worker in the room. Don't miss deadlines. To translate a vision into reality is true innovation. At Car Arms, we not only manufacture some of the most advanced firearms on the market, we build assurance and reliability through a solid history of quality. We pride ourselves on offering concealable, performance-driven firearm systems that exceed expectations time and time again. Car Arms, American ingenuity at its finest. Hello, I'm Ed Burkholzer. Today we're going to talk about bow making, basically traditional bow making. Um, I've been making traditional bows for about 30 years, maybe a little bit more. Um, I, I, I'm self-taught. I learn by getting books and reading articles on how to make bows uh, as the Native Americans did from scratch. Um, so basically what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about how we made the bows, how we make them, the process, and then I have some bows to show you of uh, the finished products. But basically to make a bow, you go out and you cut down a tree. Now, in the area we live here, there's a lot of good wood, uh, hickory, ash. This is a piece of maple that I just uh, started a bow on. But basically, <clears throat> you, you, you would cut the tree down, caulk both ends of it with like an Elmer's glue or a, um, some type of a paint to seal it. And then you let it, let it sit and dry for about a year. So this, this, uh, this particular piece has been drying for a little over a year. I split it in half and actually made one of these bows out of the other half of this tree. But to make, to make a bow with this, you're going to do two things. You're going to, using, using just metal tools, you're going to cut. You're going to cut wood off the one side and trim it down and start shaping it. Uh, this is a long process because this is a pretty big tree. I don't use any power tools, just, uh, you know, steel, metal tools, but you're basically taking off wood and making it narrower. Now, um, that, this, is, this is basically the belly of the bow. This will be the inside of the bow. The back of the bow is pretty simple to do, and I've done half of it. You're going to take your draw knife and scrape off the bark and the inner bark all the way down. I've done half of this, as you can see. And what you have, this is the, going to be the front of the bow, is a nice pristine piece. So that will be the front of the bow, like, like so. But you keep chopping it, cutting it. Uh, sometimes use a tomahawk to get pieces off and basically get it down 
to, uh, to what you would call a stave. Right now, this is nowhere near, you know, this will take hours to get to this, that situation where you can actually call it a bow. But basically, you got the belly and you got the back of the bow. And you're working it with metal tools, no power tools, until you get it shaped in the type of bow that you want to make. Now, what I do when I make a bow is I use an encyclopedia of actual Native American bows that are in museums throughout the country. And it, it, each one, each bow will tell you the dimensions, the tribe, the type of wood, how wide it is, and so forth. And I will replicate or try to replicate that particular bow based on a, an actual specimen of that bow that's in a museum somewhere in the country. So I work out of two volumes of this for the Eastern tribes and the one for the Western tribes. Uh, I get my information to when I learned how to make bows from the, bow the Boyer's Bible. There's four volumes of this. And this basically tells you from scratch how to do what I was just describing. How to start with a tree, how to uh, cut the ends, seal the ends, and then start shaping the bow. So this one will probably take another, I don't know how many hours before it gets to a point where you could actually say, okay, it's a bow. Uh, we can start bending it. So here's, here's a bow that I work, I'm working on. Now you can see how crooked this is. So this is a kind of a unique bow. Um, you go out and you cut a crooked tree. This is a, a basically a piece of uh, hickory. And I'm working it. The front of the bow, like we said on here, is the uh, right under the bark. And the, and the belly of the bow is the inner part. So we, we cut it, cut it, cut it, shave it down, put knocks on it, and then basically you start doing what's called tillering. And basically you're bending it to see how it bends. You want to get both limbs to bend about the same way. And then you start, you know, cutting it, trimming it down. Uh, for that I use a furrier's file, which is basically what a... Uh, a horse, a, someone the horse does horseshoes on the on the horses. But basically, I use this to trim it down, shape it, and get it, you know, to the to the point where you can bend it and uh, string it up and put a string on it. But basically, that's that's the process. It may take me. 70 to 80 hours to get it to a point where it, it, it would be actually a bow. And what happens sometimes as you're doing it, you know, you'll get all done. This is just a tree. It's a piece of wood. So you can be doing it and t uh, tillering it and get it and uh, it breaks. So you cry, you throw it in the wood pile and you start another thing. But this does happen. This, you know, there's no, there's no way to to know what's, what's this piece of wood. It might have a weak spot in there. So when you're getting it uh, tillered, it may crack and break. But that's all part of the, part of the job. This is, this is a hickory tree that I just cut about six months ago. And uh, it's a lot smaller than that one. But this is basically what you do. You cut the tree, you caulk both ends, and you let it sit for a year or so. And then you start working it. And then sometimes I make the bow, as the Native Americans did, with stone tools. So basically, what I would do, instead of using the metal tools, the hand tools, I would use stone devices that I've made myself. So basically, to cut down the tree, I'd use a hand axe, which is basically a piece of flint that is beveled and sharpened down takes a lot longer to do this 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 way than it would with, with metal tools. But basically chop chop the tree down. So you get the tree and then you start scraping it. Just like we did with the with the metal tools, but we're gonna scrape the belly of the bow. In this case this is a, a, a sapling of a of a, a very small um, hickory tree. But it takes a long time with, with stone tools to scrape it and scrape it and scrape it and scrape it to, to get it into the shape of a bow. So 
this bow, although it's very thin and very small, um, probably took me a hundred hours to do it because I'm using I'm using uh, you know just stone tools that I've made purposely for this purpose to scrape to make the shape of the bow. Um, so if I was going to be working a bow like that with the stone tools, basically, instead of using the, uh, you scrape it with this, with a stone tool. It takes a long time to get the wood off, but you can see I'm taking wood off with this just as it would with a, with a, a metal tool. So we go through that, shape it just like we would with the metal tools until you get the shape that you want. Of the 35 or 40 bows that I've made, let me show you some of my favorites. We'll start with this bow here. This is from the Penobscot tribe from Maine. And as you can see, this is a double bow. And for some reason, the tribe in Maine made the bows differently than everybody else by putting a second bow on top of the, the, the main bow. And basically what people thought was that this would increase the, the poundage uh, and the power of the bow, which it does. But this is the Penobscot tribe in northern Maine that made their bows double. Why? We don't know. But this is, this is their, their uh, tradition, their technique. Penobscot tribe. Now this is one of my favorite bows. <clears throat> this, is, this is from the tribe in Massachusetts, the Wapanoks. And you might have heard of the Wapanoks. They're the, they're the tribe that met the pilgrims. And I guess for the first winter or so, they helped the pilgrims. They had the Thanksgiving with them. And then things got, got uh, ugly with the pilgrims in them. And they, they fought. They, uh, they you know, had wars with each other. And apparently, the, this bow, which has been named the Sunbury Bow, was taken from an Indian that was robbing a cabin in, in Massachusetts of these settlers. And um, it's in the Sunbury Museum in Massachusetts. But basically, it's the, it's the classic example of a bow that the, uh, the northern tribes used. But it's called the Sunbury Bow, and it's in the Massachusetts. It's in a museum up there, the Wapanoc tribe. OK, this bow is interesting. This is from the Seneca tribe, which is near here, the Seneca Indians. And they made a very impressive bow, as you can see. They scalloped the one side of it and attached feathers to it and put uh, red and green paint on the bow. And they even put on a little face on the top, which is called the Keeper of the Forest. But that was the Seneca tribe. They made a very fancy bow. Now we have a shorter bow. This is basically an Apache or a Comanche style bow. You can see how short it is compared to the long bows because the, the natives out west used horses. They rode on horses. So this was a bow that they would shoot at buffalo, you know, from their horseback. Thus it's very short. This bow right here, which I just completed, this is the other half of that piece of wood basically. This is a tribe called the Chinooks out in uh, Northern California. And they made what was called a paddle bow. They made it very wide and short. Why, I don't know, but that's how they, they made them. But this is a, a bow from the Western tribes up in Ca Northern California, Oregon, Washington. Um, again, it's, a, it's, it's the way they made the bows in that particular area. This bow here is not Native American. This is an English longbow. And uh, as some of you may know, the English longbow was instrumental in the English defeating the French at a lot of different battles because their archers would stand like 300 yards away and launch arrows at them. It's made differently. It's rounded instead of flat. But that's the English longbow. Here's the bow of the Shawnee tribe. It's a little bit shorter than the other longbows from the East Coast but it's basically a hickory bow. And this one I've backed with rawhide, which gives it a little bit more strength and uh, it, it creates a bond so that, so that the bow doesn't break as easily. But that's the, uh, the Shawnee bow. 
And this one is one of my favorites. It's not any particular tribe, but I cut a crooked tree, as you can see, and you make a crooked bow. And the only thing that you have to do is get the string to line up with the rest so that the arrow is going straight off. But this is basically just kind of a novelty bow. I have it backed with a rattlesnake skin. Same purpose, to give it a little bit more strength, and it's kind of a camouflage. My, the last bow I have is my favorite. This is made out of the wood called Osage, which is a kind of a Midwestern type wood. It doesn't grow much around here. But this is the bow I go to when I hunt, hunt deer uh, or pheasants, if I'm using the flu-flu uh, arrows for the pheasants. But this is uh, backed with a prairie rattler, and it's, uh, it's Osage. It's a beautiful wood. It's one of the best bow woods you can get. Okay, now the bows that I've made over the years, they're all between 35 and 45 pounds, most of them. Uh, a few of them are more powerful, like 65 to 70 pounds. I actually made one long English longbow uh, that's over 80 pounds. That's really hard for me to pull back. And basically, I make everything on the bow myself. The strings I make from the, the Dacron, or I sometimes use twisted, twisted uh, rawhide uh, from a deer or I made one recently from a groundhog skin. And uh, then I wrap, I make the handles out of uh, deer skin, either buck skin or rawhide. I put um, the backing on the bows, like we were saying, the, the uh, rattlesnake skin or the uh, rawhide. And I put on what's called beaver balls, which is a piece of fur. Could be beaver, could be mink, could be otter. But it basically takes the twang out of the string when you, uh, when you shoot it deadens the, the noise of it. But basically everything that uh, is on these bows, I make myself by hand. You may ask, what do I use to shoot out of these bows? Well, I, I make my own arrows, my own quivers, my own flint-napped heads. But basically I make arrows to uh, hunt with or to target shoot with. And uh, I make them from scratch. And I put a, I, I nap my own uh, flint head on it use turkey feathers for the fletchings, and carve, carve the knocks in it. But it's basically uh, traditional type primitive arrows that go with the, uh, the bows. Um, besides those arrows, I also make arrows that replicate from the encyclopedias, arrows that are made by different tribes. As the, as the Native Americans made their, each tribe made their bows a little different, they also made their arrows different. Now, the way they fletched them is it was a sign of, of which tribe they were, but like some of them made two, two fletchings, some of them made three fletchings, which is what basically the archers use today, three fletchings. Some of them would twist them, cut part of the feather off and twist the fletching, but it was all designed to, you know, make the arrow fly, and each tribe had a little bit different, different way of making them. So I make those, some just two, some three, and each tribe had their own little, uh, their own little distinct way of making them. Now I also make some arrows uh, in a traditional style. These I made out of bamboo. Go to the hardware store, you buy bamboo to tie up your tomato plants. Well, you can straighten them with heat and, and make a nice straight arrow out of it. And, and bamboo, believe it or not, is very durable. So I made these arrows all out of bamboo, turkey tails, feathers for the feathers. And uh, I use these for target shooting. And they're, they're very uh, inexpensive to make because you can buy the, the, the raw materials for uh, next to nothing at your uh, gardening, gardening shop. Then I also make the quivers that go with it. I have some quiver here as a bear. Here's a beaver. And here's one of my favorites. This is a bobcat. When I used to do some, some trapping, I used to use whatever I caught to make quivers and possibles bag. But basically, this is a bobcat that holds my, uh, my hunting arrows with the flint points. And don't forget, if you want to try to learn how to make traditional bows, this is the book to start with. This is the Boyer's Bible, Volume 1. There's four volumes, 
It'll tell you step by step what to do for all different types of uh, Native American bows and, and European bows. So basically it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of hard work, but it's very rewarding. And uh, you know, just to shoot the arrows out of the bows you made or hunt and harvest some game with them is very rewarding. Hey, Joanne, you know, it's every time we see Ed Burkholzer, he's got something different. He's a, he's a man of, of all seasons. He's doing something mm -hmm. every one of the seasons. So, you know, it doesn't matter what it is outdoors, he's doing something. One thing he does all year, of course, is the bow making. Exactly. That's amazing. I think he goes out and cuts that proper wood and saves it and let it dry properly so he can make a great bow. I think yeah. that's wonderful. Yeah, he does that. And he yeah. uses several different kinds of wood. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so it's a, it's a good thing. And, and it's a good <laughs> hobby, you know, because it takes, you don't have to do it all at once. You do it. Right. Every couple of days when you get some time or on the weekend, mm -hmm. you can just take it and work with it and work with it. And by mm -hmm. the end of the year, you have a bow to go hunting with. Even if yes. you bought the arrows and the string and everything else, you don't have to make all that. But you could actually go out there with a bow and, uh, and be successful with it. That's right. And that's really nice, you know, because if you work on things like that for all of the seasons and all the things that he does, he's got the right equipment. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's a pass it on kind of a thing. Yeah. You know, it's great to pass it on to, you know, our children and everybody else. Mm -hmm. Out in Benezet County and out in Benezet in Elk County, they're out viewing elk right now. So it's a great time to go out there. If you have an opportunity, take a drive out. You can see the leaves changing. Right. You can go out there. You can stay. You're social distancing and do all the things you need to do. But there's about 1,400 elk out there <laughs> roaming around in the counties. You just drive around or go to the viewing areas. They've got it really set up. It's a wonderful place. Go online, check that out. And it's very different than seeing deer. Oh, They're absolutely. Real. It's very, They're very interesting. About two or three times the size of a deer, <laughs> so it really is different. So besides the leaf changing, the seasons are changing, everything's happening. Uh, you know, there's fall fishing, of course, which mm -hmm. is really great. The dove season open, squirrel season open, woodcock, rough grouse, rabbits, all open October 17th. <laughs> you know, they're coming in. So there's so much to do out there, and it's time to get prepared. It, it get is. Get out and do some of that stuff. Absolutely. Uh, go out and camp while you're doing it, too. Uh, absolutely. I, we're going to go. We're going to maybe try to do a little that camping. That sounds like fun. We'll do something. Fall camping is fun. You know, it's out there when you can get out there and have the nice fire pit and do mm -hmm. all that. That's like uh, that. really wonderful. We're going to be somewhere, but you can bet. We're going to be out in the open. Absolutely. Out in the Open is brought to you by Buck Hill Firearms in Mountain Home, Pennsylvania, the Northeast number one online retailer of firearms, the Pennsylvania Outdoor Writers Association, an organization of professional communicators promoting Pennsylvania's natural resources, conservation, and our hunting and fishing heritage, and by the Car Firearms Group, the number one choice for personal carry. And by the Tommy Gun Warehouse in Greeley, where you'll find the largest retail showroom in Northeast for all kinds of new and used firearms.